Often regarded as savages, heathens, and barbarians, Vikings were mostly a sophisticated and civilized society defying the expectations of contemporary Europeans who considered them nothing but a menace. However, Vikings' victims were not entirely wrong about them. There was a lot of nutty and messed up stuff going on that was considered normal in the Viking Age. Welcome to Nutty History, and today let's find out what creepy things were normal in the Viking Age. Slavery wasn't invented by the Vikings, but they sure did take it to another level of sadism. Owning the European sailing waters, Vikings were invading the shores of other nations in their tremendous but terrifying longboats and creating a network of the slave trade. According to historians, Vikings had their entire economy thriving on selling and buying slaves. Ireland was particularly a favorite spot for raiding among Vikings. Cities like Dublin and Limerick actually began as Viking slave trade hubs. For centuries, Vikings used these ports to ship the loot they gathered, plundering and pillaging the rest of Ireland, Britain, and France. Thanks to pop culture today, it's a common myth that Vikings targeted monasteries specifically for their riches, or they considered Christianity an inferior religion to their own. While they didn't have any strong feelings toward other religions, and of course the treasure of the monastery was a bonus to the raid, the primary objective was raiding monasteries was always monks. Why were Vikings after religious men, you ask? Because they were literate and usually prone to subjugation. This made them the perfect candidate for slavery. Also, obviously, they were supposed to be castrated. You can't really blame the Vikings for that, as eunuch slaves were in demand back in Byzantine and the Middle East in those days. In the Eastern Roman Empire and the Middle East, eunuchs were considered the perfect candidate for jobs such as teachers, harem guards, administrative roles on various levels, and palace servants. High demand from the East and the easy supply by Vikings elevated Mediterranean slave trade to an industrious level. For Vikings, these monasteries were like the source of raw material, which would yield high profits for them. All they had to do was go on a raid, grab some subservient monks who were already trained in the service of God, and ship them to Venice where they would be castrated and sold to their Eastern masters. They also kept a few of these slaves for themselves. You might remember Athelstan from the Viking series who was a slave. He served Ragnar Lodbrok, who in turn showed kindness and considered Athelstan a friend. However, in real life, Vikings weren't always as kind with slaves as Ragnar was with Athelstan. A disturbing discovery has confirmed that not only did Vikings keep slaves, but they also liked to take them along in the afterlife as well. Just like the Mesopotamian kings, Vikings had rituals to sacrifice the slaves on their master's demise so they can accompany them to the graves. Oddly, slaves were not only sacrificed by decapitation, but they were also buried without their heads. It is believed that Vikings did so to differentiate the master and the slaves. And one could wonder if Vikings did so to make sure slaves wouldn't rat out the abuse of Odin on reaching Valhalla with their masters. Vikings had a different kind of relationship with their animals. The average Viking family could not afford a barn, so it wasn't irregular to enter their longhouse and find them laying there with their pigs and their cows and the rest of the cattle. Vikings also loved their pets, and not only did they let their cats, dogs, and bears sleep in the bed with them, they would also take them on raids. Wait a second. The scripts say bears? Bears? Huh? On a slow day during the raids, Vikings would like to go in the wild and raid bear dens to abduct their cubs. They would bring them back home and raise these cubs as house bears. Now, as crazy and wild as it sounds, pet bears were quite useful for keeping slaves in line and protecting the cattle. Of course, that doesn't negate the dangers of having a giant wild animal roaming almost free in a civilization, so a lot of Viking settlements would levy heavy fines on the family that owned a bear, or they would outright ban them. Still, some families would risk having them no matter what. Based on Viking sagas and generational stories, it is believed that Vikings had to assemble at Uppsala every nine years to conduct a festival in a bid to please the gods. And obviously, to please the Vikings' gods, they had to make sacrifices. At Uppsala, 99 men, horses, dogs, and hawks were sacrificed every nine years to please the chief deity, Odin. It was believed in Norse mythology that to gain the wisdom of the whole universe, Odin once sacrificed himself to himself. 
He did that by plucking out his eye and throwing it in Mimer's well, shoving his spear Gungnir in his belly in a ritualistic way, and then hanged himself to Yggdrasil, the world tree, for nine days and nine nights. There's more to the story, but this channel is about the history and not mythology, so we digress, but now you know why nine was considered a sacred number for Vikings. Vikings at Uppsala will sacrifice humans, horses, dogs, and hawks in a set of nine and hang them from the trees of the Holy Grave to recreate the sacrifice of Odin to please him. It is believed in modern pop culture that these sacrificial humans were adult volunteers who would willingly walk up to the sacrificial altar to die. They did so to get a special place in Valhalla in the afterlife. However, both sagas and archaeological findings tell us that the truth was way darker than religious conditioning. According to historian Harry Brown, there are no actual sources to implement that the sacrificial people at Uppsala were volunteering. Moreover, disturbingly archaeological excavations at a sacrificial site have revealed that most sacrifices were children under the age of 10. Further, a historical record from the 10th century by Ibn Fadlan told the story of a slave girl who tried to refuse to be sacrificed. This angered the Vikings surrounding her and she was assaulted by at least six men and they dragged her to the altar for her execution. Records of Viking households indicate that boys often outnumber girls by a huge margin. On average, a common Viking house may have four male children for every one female child. In worst cases, the ratio may exaggerate to nine to one in favor of the boys. Surely you must be thinking that's not how human biology works, or was there something special about the Viking gene that they mostly produced manly men? Well, legends can be deceiving and so was the case with this mystery as well. Vikings gave birth to both male and female babies all the time without much difference, but a child wasn't considered a kid to the parent until it was named. The modern ceremony of naming or christening a child in the Western world comes from the Vikings who had a ritual for the same called Osavatni. A child was welcomed into the family only after receiving its name in the ceremony. So that left wiggle room for the parents to abandon the baby if they didn't wish to keep it, and usually girls drew the shorter stick. Yes, it is as horrible as it sounds. Before Osavatni, parents would quality check their child for any deformities, curse, illness, or weakness to make the decision about keeping it. Sadly, gender could be considered such a weakness. This was no different than the ancient practices of chucking the baby followed in Mesopotamia and Sparta. However, once Osavatni was performed, a child was now the responsibility of its parents, and any attempt to get rid of it could get them in trouble with the Viking law. Viking raids were no different than any other battle in the history of humans. To do the pillaging, raiding, and kidnapping, a Viking had to do lots and lots of violence along with many unspeakable things. Clearly, that sort of experience would leave a mark on the psyche, no matter what sort of upbringing and mental strength one had. So, when they returned home with a medieval version of shell shock or post-traumatic stress disorder, it wasn't easy to turn the crazy off and become a normal father, husband, and farmer. It was an everyday ordeal, and Nordic civilians had to come up with methods to help them cope and rehabilitate. One might assume that sports and recreational activities could be a good way to help them cope, but ironically, even sports were a health hazard in Nordic society. For instance, the Viking swimming race wasn't about swimming faster, but who could waterboard their opponent longer. Even innocent games like catch and tag could turn bloody any second, and it was considered extremely normal. The Vikings' ruling was that one can stop playing anytime they want, so if they stay in the game long enough to get hurt, it's their own fault. To think of it, it's getting clearer why Vikings had trouble getting over PTSD. According to Dr. Taryn Wills of the University of Aberdeen, the problem of PTSD became so severe for Viking settlements that the Viking sagas were not just written to glorify Vikings, but also to warn the future Vikings of what fate was waiting for them in adulthood. What do you think a Viking would find creepy about our modern society? Or do you think we missed any creepy stuff in this video? Tell us in the comments. If you'd like to watch more creepy stuff that was normal in history, check out these videos on the screen. Don't forget to mash that like button. And as always, thanks for watching Nutty History.